Jersey. I'm from Roxbury, New Jersey, which is about 50 miles west of here. Uh, I, uh, I've spoken uh, at several places uh, about the presidents uh, at the Grover Cleveland Birthplace site. There's a couple of folks right here. Thank you for coming out. Grover Cleveland's home in Caldwell, New Jersey. If you get a chance, uh, uh, it's right across the river. Uh, and I've also, uh, also spoken at the James A. Garfield National Historic Site in Mentor, uh, Ohio. Uh, so I'd like to start off my presentation by uh, saying something that I've never said before in a presentation, which is explaining what I don't know. Uh, so I just wanted to start off by saying I'm, uh, I'm no expert on Freemasonry. Uh, I know some about the presidents in Freemasonry, but by no means uh, I'm an expert in that field. Uh, what I do know is I have a knowledge of presidential funerals, uh, and, uh, and from my research in presidential funerals, I've seen Freemasons uh, have played varying roles in many of the presidential funerals. Uh, in doing the, uh, doing the research uh, for this presentation, the first thing I did is that I went back to my own book, uh, and I found uh, over 60 references uh, to Freemasons. Uh, here's all of the presidential Freemasons. Uh, and also what I did is that I looked at much of the source material uh, that I used in uh, preparing my book, The President is Dead, and again, found more layers of uh, uh, Freemasons involvement. Uh, and then what I did is that I looked back on the photographs of the places that I went to. Because uh, when I visit places, presidential graves or birthplaces or homes, I'll take hundreds of pictures and a lot of times I'll find the several that I want to put in my book or that uh, I'll reference. And I was surprised in doing this secondary research, going back to these photographs, how often there's markers for Freemasons or the Freemason emblem uh, by the president's grave. Uh, so I was really excited uh, to do this presentation uh, and to do this extra research to really find out more about the Freemasons' involvement. Uh, so to start off the presentation, uh, I usually I always start all my presentations with uh, First in war, the first in peace, uh, first in our hearts, the first president to pass away, uh, which was George Washington. Uh, in December of 1799, George Washington was 67 years old. Uh, he was relatively in good health, uh, and he, uh, he had his routine. He lived at Mount Vernon. He always, always wanted to retire to Mount Vernon. After uh, serving in the Continental Army, he went back to Mount Vernon. Uh, after serving as president, he went back to Mount Vernon and he was repeatedly called into service. Uh, Mount Vernon uh, was where he wanted to uh, spend the rest of his days. Uh, so he had his routine. Every day Washington would normally uh, uh, he'd mount his horse and he'd ride around his thousands of acres on his, uh, on his Mount Vernon plantation. Uh, he'd uh, check his livestock. He. Uh, 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 check the crops, he'd see if any fences needed mending, and he'd check on the over uh, 300 slaves that, uh, that Washington owned as well as Martha's family owned, or Martha's uh, from her previous marriage. Uh, on December 12th, Thursday, December 12th, Washington, like any other day, uh, took a ride around Mount Vernon, but that day it started snowing. And, uh, and he came back after several hours of riding around and he was drenched in snow. Uh, his head was, uh, uh, was cold and wet, down his back, his clothes were soaked. Uh, but Washington decided that he was fine, didn't need to go change before he had his dinner. Before he had his dinner. Uh, so historians like to speculate why Washington would have done that. You kind of like look uh, through this uh, sort of, uh, try to get into his mindset. Uh, Washington lived his book, or, or I'm sorry, Washington lived his life uh, following a book of rules about, uh, about courteousness and how to behave. Uh, 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 manners. Uh, so some people speculate that he didn't want to keep anybody else waiting while he went up and changed into drier clothes. Uh, and that's the reason he uh, chose not to change. Uh, I suspect that even at 67, Washington was a tough old general and uh, decided that he didn't need to change before he ate. But Washington got sick uh, and he started to develop a throat infection. Uh, but the next day, December 13th, now Friday, Washington does the same thing. He goes uh, back out onto his plantation, rides around again into the snow. Uh, so Washington comes back uh, sicker than he was the day before. Uh, his personal uh, assistant, a man named Tobias Lear, had suggested that he get medical assistance or that he take medication at the time. Uh, 
And he told Lear, he says, you know, I never take anything for a cold, let it go as it came. Uh, so the next morning, now December 14, 3 o'clock in the morning, Washington uh, was very sick now. His, uh, he developed uh, a, a throat infection. Uh, and his uh, throat started to, uh, started to seize up. He couldn't swallow. He had problems breathing, problems speaking. Uh, so finally, about 3 o'clock in the morning, he was in bad shape, and he, uh, and he uh, agreed to get some sort of medical attention. Uh, First person that Washington called, though, was a man named George Rawlins, who worked on the plantation. Uh, Rawlins would treat the slaves on the plantation. wasn't a certified doctor or anything, but the, but the thing that Rawlins knew was bleeding, uh, and that's what Washington wanted to be bled. That was the that was the pretty much the panacea of the day. And actually, every president up until Zachary Taylor, who died in 1850, uh, almost every president was bled on their deathbed. Uh, but no one was bred, was bled like George Washington was. Uh, so George, Wa so uh, uh, George Rawlins took blood. Uh, he was a little hesitant, so Washington implored on him, "Take more blood. You're not taking enough." Uh, uh, unsurprisingly, Washington didn't feel better. So, it, so, so later in the morning, he finally agreed to getting uh, to getting more professional medical assistance. So he called a man named Dr. James Creek. Uh, Creek came to the home, uh, and he called uh, for a consulting physician, by the, uh, a man by the name of Dr. Gustavus Richard Brown. Uh, now he got nervous that Brown wouldn't arrive in time because Washington's condition was continuing to plummet, so he called a man named uh, Dr. Elisha Cullen Dick. Oh, there it is. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Dick uh, lived in uh, 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 nearby uh, Alexandra, he studied at the University of Pennsylvania under Dr. Benjamin Rush, and he was also a member of the Freemasons in the same Lodge 22 as George Washington. Uh, so now there was, uh, by the time, so uh, Dick got there about 3 o'clock, and then Brown got there about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, so now there was four physicians, three physicians plus, uh, uh, plus George Rawlins that had treated Washington, and uh, they all pretty much did the same thing. Uh, and they bled him. Uh, so within a space of about 12 hours, uh, 82 ounces of blood was taken from George Washington, which is about 40% of his blood. Uh, when I do uh, presentations that I drive to, I've got uh, a little more material that I take, and I bring uh, a bottle of V8 to show how much blood it is, because 84 ounces is a lot of blood. Uh, now one of the things that I found in doing the research uh, for this presentation uh, is that of the four, there was only one doctor that objected to the bleeding, and that was Dr. Dick. Uh, so what Dr. Dick wanted to do was perform a uh, tracheotomy, which was a very risky surgery at the time to allow Washington to breathe. Uh, uh, Elisha Dick had never done it on a living patient before, uh, and he didn't even have the equipment to do it. Uh, but later on, he said, maybe a little bit disingenuously later on in life, he said that, I shall never cease to regret that the operation was not performed. Uh, the physicians also uh, applied a blister of cantharides to his throat, which is uh, an excruciating practice that was, to, that was believed to draw out the deadly humors from his body. Uh, now, several of these medical instruments that were used are now on display uh, at the Washington Masonic Memorial in Alexandria. Uh, so, everything that the doctors did uh, was out of the best intentions. Uh, they truly uh, admired Washington, uh, but it was written that every action that they took increased his suffering and hastened his death. Uh, so Washington uh, knew he was failing. He knew later on in the day, uh, uh, he knew that his time was close. He had. Martha burned one of his wills. He had two wills, and he had Martha burn one of them. Uh, so he's now struggling to speak. It's later on in the afternoon, and he's speaking again to Tobias Lear, to his personal secretary. And his number one concern in those final hours, uh, after he'd taken care of his will and all of his other family business, was he was scared of being buried alive. Uh, so in 1799, this was a real concern. 
there were documented cases where doctors were unable to tell the difference between a comatose, uh, a comatose and uh, a deceased patient. Uh, and this was actually an invention from 1792 called a safety coffin, which had a <coughs> bell inside of it, uh, or had a string inside attached to a bell outside. So if the, if the dead person woke up, they can ring the bell, uh, and the more wealthy people would be able to pay someone to sit outside of their grave uh, for three days. Uh, so Washington told Lear, do not let them put me in the coffin, do not, uh, uh, do not let them put me in the coffin and close the coffin for three days. Uh, so Tobias Lear, by all accounts, really loved General Washington, and uh, I'm sure he probably nodded and was in denial, uh, but he didn't answer him directly. So Washington, again, with the last, uh, the last uh, words that he could muster, said, do you understand me? He wanted to make sure that Lear understood uh, that he didn't want to be in the coffin for three days. Uh, and then Lear said yes. And then Washington spoke his final words, which were, tis well. Almost like saying, like, okay. Uh, later that night, sometime before 11 o'clock, uh, Washington passed away. Uh, Dr. Uh, Elisha Dick then carefully noted his measurements uh, so they can fit the coffin. Uh, he actually he, uh, he measured Washington at, at six feet three and a half inches, although most sources uh, have him at six feet two inches, uh, and his from shoulders from across was one foot nine inches. Uh, he was Washington's body was placed in the coffin with his Masonic apron and sword, and then in Washington's will he had uh, uh, several uh, uh, several items in his will of note. One is that he freed all of the slaves that he had owned because Martha's uh, because Martha owned some of the uh, of the slaves from her previous marriage. So all of the slaves that Washington owned, he uh, he freed upon Martha's death, uh, which uh, she had passed in 1802, and he and he uh, uh, had stipulated in his will that to uh, uh, to make sure they have homes and they have education and they have work. Uh, also in his will, he asked for no funeral oration. He didn't want a funeral. Uh, but the Freemasons approached Martha Washington and asked if they could bury General Washington, if they could perform his funeral ceremonies. Uh, so the Freemasons, along with military uh, uh, figures, uh, had the funeral. Now Washington had died on the 14th. Uh, uh, remember, he asked for three days not to be placed in the coffin. So they actually waited four days for the funeral. Uh, and this is something that, that I came across for no other presidential funerals, and maybe this speaks to, to the Freemasons' uh, uh, conscientiousness or uh, being well organized or being prepared. But a, a rain date was set for the funeral. Uh, I never saw that before. So the funeral was held on the 18th, the rain date was held on the 19th, although the 18th was apparently good weather. Uh, so hundreds of Masons gathered uh, at Mount Vernon on the 18th. Uh, uh, for the most part, the biggest representation was from Lodge 22, which was both uh, Dr. Elisha Dix and General Washington's Lodge. Uh, the pallbearers uh, were all Freemasons, uh, and the, uh, the four gentlemen that actually carried the, uh, the coffin, or the body bearers, were also all Freemasons. Uh, one of them by the, was uh, a man by the name of William Moss. Uh, Moss, I'm not sure of his age, but he might have been elderly, because it was written that Moss broke down under the weight of the casket and removing the beer from the mansion to the tomb. Uh, so seizing upon the opportunity was uh, another mason uh, from Lodge 22 by the, by the name of George Coriel. Uh, so Coriel had occasionally done work for Washington at Mount Vernon. Uh, Coriel outlived all of the other mason pallbearers, and uh, he's actually, it's interesting, I came across his grave in Lambertville, New Jersey. Just happened to be walking around one day with my family. Uh, and there's, uh, 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 he died at the age of 91 on February 18, 1850. And uh, on the uh, inscription, it might be tough to read, uh, but there's uh, two lines of note uh, on the inscription of the grave. The first one is that he was a brother of General Washington in Lodge 22. And the second one was that he was the last survivor of the men who laid the father of our country in his tomb. So at the funeral, uh, 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 Worshipful Master Dr. Elisha Cullen Dick uh, performed the ceremony of Masonic uh, funeral rites. Uh, 
they removed the, uh, the apron and the sword from the coffin, and it was written that every mason cast upon the coffin an evergreen sprig. They placed George Washington in, uh, in what is now considered the old tomb. If anyone's been to Mount Vernon, there's the old tomb and the new tomb. Uh, uh, now Washington, uh, another clause that he had in his will is that he had, uh, uh, had asked for a new tomb to be built. Uh, and he was very specific about the size of it and the location. And the reason that he did that was because the old tomb, pictures here, was prone to flooding. Uh, it's a little difficult to see, but there was actually at one point up to 14 coffins in this old tomb. So it goes back pretty far. Uh, so you have uh, a tomb prone to flooding, wooden coffins. Uh, it pretty soon became pretty messy in there. Coffins started to rot. It was actually written that there was bones strewn about the tomb. Uh, so Washington had asked that this be done. Uh, he didn't put any time frame on it, but obviously he wanted this done relatively quickly. But just like anything else, when you have something to do at home, you kind of put it off. That's what it seemed like happened there. 30 years later, Washington is still uh, in this old tomb. Uh, and at the time, it's really, it's, it's gotten very messy in there with the, with the rotted wood uh, uh, and the bones. Uh, so at the time, Mount Vernon was owned by Washington's nephew, a man named John Augustine Washington. Uh, and this was in the late 1820s, early 1830s. Uh, John uh, Augustine Washington had a problem with his gardener, uh, and he fired the gardener. Uh, now this gardener decided that uh, he was going to get his revenge, and what he plotted to do was sneak back into Mount Vernon, break into the old tomb, and steal Washington's skull. Uh, and that's what he did, or at least that's what he thought he did. Uh, it was such a mess inside of that tomb that he stole a skull, but it wasn't George Washington's skull. <laughs> it was one of Washington's in-laws that was also encrypted in the tomb. So they found him the next day, uh, and they found the skull, but not Washington's skull. But the good news is that it finally prompted the family to build the permanent tomb. Which if you go to Mount Vernon, this is what you'll see now. This is where Washington was built. Uh, now I know the date that the tomb was built, what I don't know is that uh, if the Freemasons were involved in building the tomb. What I do know is that uh, either they built it or there was a, a cornerstone ceremony. Because in 1903 there were some repairs done and uh, one of the bricks contained the Masonic emblem. Uh, but it was so damaged by that point that they had to, get, uh, that they had to discard it uh, and a replica brick was uh, made and then placed uh, at, the, uh, at the new tomb. For the 100 year anniversary of the death, uh, on December 14, 1899, the Masons held a huge ceremony uh, at the tomb. Uh, there was Masons from every state of the Union that uh, uh, attended. Uh, the ceremony started at the old tomb. Uh, an address was made by the Grand Master of the Masons of Colorado. And, and the reason that he was, that, uh, was given that honor is because it was his idea to have this ceremony for the 100th anniversary. Uh, they marched to the new tomb where it was written that beautiful and impressive Masonic services were conducted. Uh, and uh, the various Masons deposited several symbolic items on the sarcophagus, including uh, a lambskin apron, a white glove, and an, ever, uh, and, uh, uh, an evergreen. Uh, and a final address was made by fellow Mason and the president, William McKinley. This was 1899. Uh, for the 200th anniversary, uh, they recreated uh, the uh, funeral, uh, and it was filmed on, uh, on C-SPAN. Now again, I'm not sure if the Masons were involved, but I suspect they were, because uh, over here you can see the, the Masonic apron. Uh, so I'm assuming that actual Masons, probably from Lodge 22, were involved in the, uh, in the recreation of the funeral ceremonies. Uh, uh, and today, it was written on, uh, uh, on the Mount Vernon website, uh, I found this, uh, that it says, for more than a century, nearly a dozen Masonic groups have organized formal wreath layings in Washington's tomb before the estate is open to the public, when a feeling of tranquility and authenticity overwhelms the grounds. In February and December, temperatures at 8 o'clock in the morning are typically below freezing, yet the Masons are as dependable and hardy as the man they honor. So that was taken directly from the Mount Vernon website. Now, Andrew Jackson was a Mason. And uh, this, again, going through my uh, uh, photographs when I visited there, I found this Masonic marker. Uh, 
uh, at the tomb of Andrew Jackson. Uh, Masons marched in the funeral ceremony. Andrew Jackson died in 1845. Freemasons marched in the funeral ceremony of John Quincy Adams, who died in Washington, D.C. in 1848. So in the, uh, in the procession in D.C., Freemasons marched in that. In 1849, uh, President James K. Polk died. So Polk was the youngest president to die, and he died the quickest after leaving office. He had died just 103 days after he, uh, after he left office. Uh, he was only 53 years and 225 days, so at the time, he was the youngest president to die, and he's still the youngest president to die from natural causes. Uh, some people say that he just worked himself to death, that he was an incredibly uh, hard worker in the White House. Uh, after his presidential term ended, he went on, uh, on a tour that included some southern uh, areas, and he visited uh, New Orleans, where there was a cholera outbreak, and they suspect that he had contracted uh, cholera uh, uh, during that visit. Uh, so he died uh, on June 15, 1849. Now at the time, cholera victims needed to be buried very quickly. Uh, so he was buried the next day uh, uh, in Nashville City Cemetery. Uh, Polk had requested in his final days, he knew he was failing, so he kind of dictated how he wanted his funeral. And he requested that Masonic ceremonies were conducted at the funeral. Uh, so Masons came to his home, Freemasons came to the home, they placed Polk's remains in a walnut coffin and performed a uh, Masonic ceremony at the home. And then they led the procession to Nashville Cemetery where he was placed in the ground. It was, uh, oops. It was in this plot that he was, uh, that he was buried. Uh, although there's no marker there now that says that. Uh, at the cemetery, the Masons place a spring of acacia on the coffin to symbolize the uh, immortality of the soul. A, a, a brief address was made by uh, a Masonic preaching officer and past grandmaster Wilkins Tannehill. But Polk had requested that he be buried at his home. He died in his home. It's called Polk Place. So this is where he wanted to be buried. But again, because it was because he died of cholera, they needed to be buried right away. Uh, so the following year, on May 22, 1850, a reinterment ceremony was held. Now, I've, uh, of the 38 presidents that have died, uh, 15 of them have been reinterred over the years. Uh, so this is pretty common, although rarely as often as James K. Polk. <laughs> uh, a reinterment ceremony was held on May 22. Uh, a group gathered at the cemetery. Well, they found that the coffin was intact, but they noted that only the sprig of acacia had withered. Uh, a uh, procession marched from the cemetery to the home, uh, but it was interesting. About halfway there, uh, uh, the procession met up with another procession that was led by the Freemasons, uh, and the coffin was ceremoniously uh, turned over to the Freemasons for the final leg of the journey to the home. Uh, uh, the Masonic Grand Marshals were two gentlemen, Dr. Shelby and General Clements. Uh, so uh, Polk was uh, entombed uh, on this, or was placed in the tomb right in front of the home. So that's his home, and this is the grave right here. <coughs> uh, Polk had put in his, uh, in his will that he wanted the home to stay in the Polk family. And so the first uh, qualification for owning the home was that your last name was Polk. Uh, if no people named Polk wanted the home, uh, then a blood relative was requested uh, to own the home. After a while, there was no Polks that wanted to own the home. And they actually fought his will in court. Uh, mm -hmm. And they were able to win the case. Uh, so they were able to sell it to a man named Jacob McCavick uh, Dickinson. And uh, this was in the 1890s. Uh, Dickinson later became known as the Secretary of War under Taft. Uh, so Dickinson wasn't too happy with the grave right on his front lawn, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, so disregarding Polk's wishes to be buried at his home, to remain at his home, uh, the General Assembly of Tennessee decided to move his body, and it's actually right around the corner, uh, to the State House. So this is where Polk is buried now. Uh, this was uh, uh, on September 19th, 18, uh, 1893 is when his remains were moved for the third time. Now the one thing that I like about studying the presidents and the places and their birthplaces and graves is that it's like the... Uh, these stories, some of them never end. Uh, so even last year, there was talks to try to meet Polk's wishes by having him moved 
to this home, which is a home in Columbia, Tennessee, even though he only lived here before his presidency. But this is really one of the only places you can learn about Polk. It's open to the public. Uh, so, so, made, so they've made some efforts to have the grave moved here, which would be the fourth time that Polk was moved. Now, Lincoln was moved so many times, it's tough to keep track of. Uh, some place it at 11, some place it as up to 17 times that his body was moved over the years. Uh, although, all pretty much in the same vicinity of the cemetery. Uh, Lincoln died in 1865. Uh, he died in Washington, D.C., and his remains were placed in Springfield, Illinois. Uh, it was the first time that the president was assassinated, uh, and there was a strong urge uh, for those in the North to pay their final respects for him. Uh, so his widow wanted him buried in Springfield, Illinois, where they lived. So uh, a massive, elaborate, uh, massive, elaborate uh, a uh, funeral ceremony was planned for him, where over 20 days his remains were put on display, first in D.C., and then uh, uh, in cities all throughout the North. I think it's about 13 cities. So, th so the funeral train would pull into these different cities. There'd be a massive uh, procession to take Lincoln's remains uh, to one of the most important buildings. It was actually at City Hall, where they had it uh, on April 24th in New York. He was a Senate, or he died April 15th. Uh, so this was, the uh, 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 Lincoln was the first president embalmed, so they had open casket funerals, or, or open casket viewings for 20 days after he was assassinated. So Mason's march in the parade in at least Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, uh, Cleveland, Ohio, and in Springfield, uh, Illinois, they escorted the remains from the final stop of the funeral train to the tomb. I, Probably in many more locations, Freemasons also marched, but these were the only three references that I found. Uh, in 2015, for the 150th anniversary of Lincoln's assassination, uh, Freemasons in Ohio, uh, uh, they reenacted the procession and they dedicated this marker, uh, which was uh, uh, dedicated or uh, it was erected uh, and dedicated by the Cleveland Lodge number 781 Free and Accepted Masons the Forest City Commandery, number 40, Knights Temple, uh, and Ohio History Groups. Uh, so we go from probably the best president to probably the worst president, which is James Buchanan. Uh, James Buchanan died in 1868. Uh, this is his home, Wheatlands, Pennsylvania, uh, or, or the home's name is Wheatlands, it's in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So he had also uh, uh, instructed in his uh, uh, final directions for his funeral, that he wanted no pomp and parade, but he also <coughs> wanted Freemasons to participate in the ceremony. And he also instructed that invitations be sent uh, to the three living presidents at the time, which were Andrew Johnson, Franklin Pierce, and Millard Fillmore, but none of them uh, accepted the invitation. The pallbearers were all members uh, from Buchanan's uh, Lodge, which was Lancaster Lodge 43, of the Order of Ancient York Rite Masonry. Uh, at, Woodward, uh, at Woodward Hill Cemetery, uh, the Masonic pallbearers uh, placed the coffin on the ground, uh, and then the Masons, all dressed in black suits and uh, elaborate silk hats, circled the grave, and the worshipful Master H. H., uh, H., uh, S. H. Reynolds performed the final funeral uh, rites. Then the coffin was lowered to the ground, and each Mason dropped a sprig of boxwood onto it. And you see here again, like I took the photograph of this marker with the Masonic emblem on it, didn't really pay much attention to it at the time. Uh, but going back through my photographs, it was amazing how often that Masonic emblem popped up. Now one thing that I found about uh, Masons uh, is that in several instances, uh, for uh, some of the less popular presidents, uh, they really stood up to be the only group that would uh, commemorate the presidents uh, in their death. Uh, and that happened with Andrew Johnson. So Andrew Johnson, at the time in his, uh, so he died uh, in, 18, uh, in 1868. Uh, and the newspapers were not kind to him, so he was uh, a Southerner who was uh, uh, on the Union side during the war, so he didn't have any friends in the South. Uh, after the war, he was impeached by, by, by the predominantly Northern Congress. Uh, so he didn't have any friends in the North. Uh, and the newspapers wrote that he was acknowledgedly an honest man 
uh, of, uh, of decided convictions, but he had, but he had not the pleasantest nor the mildest manner of expressing them. Uh, so the Freemasons really led the funeral of Andrew Johnson. Uh, he died at his daughter's home in uh, Elizabethton, Tennessee, which is about 20 miles from where he wanted to be buried at his home in Greenville. Uh, so Masons uh, came to the home. Uh, they wrapped his body in blankets and placed it in a pine box packed with ice. Uh, and then they escorted the remains of Andrew Johnson for the 20 mile uh, train ride uh, from Elizabethton to, uh, from, uh, uh, Elizabethton to uh, Greenville. Uh, in Greenville, there was members of Mason Lodge number 119, of which Andrew Johnson was a member, uh, had received the uh, uh, coffin at the train station. There was Masonic rituals that were performed. And then uh, Johnson was moved from the ice coffin to uh, a more ornate coffin that had Masonic symbols uh, uh, carved onto the coffin. Uh, and then, as Andrew Johnson had wished, uh, his body was wrapped in uh, an American flag with his head resting on a copy of the Constitution. So that's the way he's buried in his grave. Uh, the coffin was moved uh, to the parlor of the home and Masonic guards were stationed there to keep, uh, uh, to keep watch over the coffin. Uh, then the coffin was moved to the State House in Greenville uh, and uh, another public viewing was held there. Uh, and then the Masons carried the coffin uh, from the State House to the hearse and then they escorted the hearse to the grave site. This is, uh, this is Johnson's grave site here. Uh, at the end of the ceremony, or to close the ceremony, uh, Deputy Grand Master Connor of the Masons then spoke to close the funeral. Uh, James Garfield died 1881. He was a Mason. Uh, <coughs> Masons, uh, it was called the most impressive funeral ever witnessed. He was assassinated <coughs> in 1881, and Masons marched in his DC funeral. William McKinley died in 1901, now the third president, uh, or the third president to be uh, uh, assassinated. And now this was pretty interesting in my research. Uh, it wasn't in my book, but the actual building where President McKinley was made a mason uh, is marked in Winchester, Virginia, and it's now this restaurant that's uh, called Brewbakers. So you can see the uh, you can see the marker on the side of the restaurant. Uh, the Masons marched his funeral in Canton, Ohio. He actually died in Buffalo. His remains were taken to Canton, uh, and the Masons provided floral arrangements at the church service in Canton. Theodore Roosevelt, uh, he died in 1919. Uh, now one quote that I found from Theodore Roosevelt about the Masons, he said, one of the things that attracted me so greatly to Masonry that uh, I hailed the chance of becoming a Mason was that it really did act up to what we as a government and as a people are pledged to, of treating each man on his merits as a man. Uh, when Brother George Washington went into the lodge of the fraternity, he went into uh, into the one place in the, uh, in the United States where he stood below or above his fellows according to their uh, uh, official position in the lodge. He went into the place where the idea of our government was realized as far as, as it is humanely possible for mankind to realize a lofty idea. So that was a quote from Teddy Roosevelt uh, about the Freemasons. And as you can see here, uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, he's buried in uh, Oyster Bay in Long Island. And there's very often ceremonies there where the Boy Scouts come to visit. And uh, uh, the Freemasons on January 9, 1848, which was the 29th anniversary of uh, uh, Roosevelt's death, members of the Brooklyn, Long Island District of National League uh, Masonic Clubs visited. And uh, uh, hosting the event was Roosevelt's former lodge, which is Matt, uh, 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 Matain Cock, uh, number 806. So that's the article from the New York Times there. Uh, Warren G. Harding uh, was a Mason. Actually, this was uh, an image uh, my certificate from the Masons, but I actually, going through my photographs of visiting his home, uh, I found this image that I had taken of uh, the home uh, uh, in Ohio. Franklin Roosevelt was a Mason, uh, and one of the quotes he said is, the more I come in contact with the work of the Masonic fraternity, the more impressed I am by the great charitable work and the great practical good which we are carrying in. Uh, he died in Warm Springs, Georgia, uh, and this is a photograph over here from my visit. It's me and my two boys right there sitting in the front. Uh, and there's this marker in Warm Springs, uh, Masonic marker that was placed there. On the Franklin Roosevelt Presidential Library, though, it's written, 
that there is no evidence that FDR was given any type of uh, uh, Masonic rite as part of his funeral or that he was buried dressed in uh, uh, Masonic apron. Harry S. Truman uh, was a, a Mason in Missouri. Uh, and the funeral service, uh, one of the speakers at the funeral service was a Grand Mason, uh, was a Grand Master of the Missouri Masons, uh, which was a position that Harry Truman held in, uh, uh, in 1940. And he had said at the funeral that we as Masons extol as many virtues, not the least of which was his recognition of the high level of individual dignity. May we emulate him in his simple, sincere, sturdy, and forthright conduct. Uh, now in my book, what I also included, part of it, uh, is just some uh, other fascinating stories, or part of it I was just really uh, uh, enjoying writing the book. So I included a section called Almost Presidents. Uh, and these were four individuals uh, that held, that were presidents in some fashion of the US. Uh, so they included John Hansen, which was the first president of the Congress uh, assembled under the Articles of Confederation. Uh, a man named David Rice Atchison, who kind of like an urban legend that he was president for one day uh, in between the inauguration uh, of uh, Taylor and Polk. Uh, and uh, another man that I included was uh, Sam Houston. Sam Houston was twice president of the Republic of Texas. Uh, this was before Texas joined the Union. Uh, now, as, when, I went to, uh, when I went to visit there, he was the first president of Texas. Uh, so I went to the Sam Houston Museum, uh, and the person that I met with interview liked to call him uh, the George Washington of Texas. Uh, but he was, uh, but he served two non-consecutive terms, so I prefer to call him the Grover Cleveland of Texas, uh, <laughs> because Cleveland was the 22nd and 24th president. Uh, so Sam Houston uh, was a, a mason that helped uh, establish the Grand Lodge of Texas in 1837. Uh, and now Mason, or I'm sorry, uh, Sam Houston uh, was against the secession of Texas during the Civil War. Uh, and now Houston owned about 12 slaves of his own, so he wasn't morally opposed to slavery, but he didn't believe that secession was the right way to go about it. Uh, so this position made him an outcast in Texas. Uh, when he, uh, and it cost him the governor's office, by this point Texas was a state, uh, and it cost him the governor's office and he died uh, uh, on July 26, 1863. And he was really a pariah in his community. Uh, and the oral tradition holds that the local minister and the undertaker wouldn't even, uh, 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 even participate in his services. Uh, so a woodworker from the Union troops in Huntsville Penitentiary, which is where the Union troops were being held in 1863, offered to build the coffin, and the Masons offered to hold the funeral service for him. Uh, so a uh, half dozen or so Masons uh, performed their ceremony at the home. And actually this was a recreation uh, that was done several years ago, I think for the 150th anniversary. Uh, afterwards, the Freemasons carried the coffin to Oakwood Cemetery where they performed their uh, burial ceremony. And this is Sam Houston's grave in Texas. Uh, there's a marker in the back of the grave that mentions his role uh, uh, in Freemasons. Uh, and there's this stone marker on the ground that mentions that he helped uh, found the first lodge in Texas. So from my research, a couple of things struck me. Uh, one is that the Freemasons were loyal to the presidents. Uh, even when some of the presidents, when they died, they weren't that popular. Uh, and they seem to perform a role of what was necessary to perform in the presidential funerals. Thank you very much. <laughs>